hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1 you will hear a lecturer talking about food preservation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. In today's lecture, I'd like to look at the topic of food preservation and start by asking the obvious question, why do we need to preserve food? Well, apart from keeping it fresh for our daily needs, many foods such as fruit and vegetables are only available at certain times of the year. So if we want to be able to eat these foods all year round, we need to preserve them. We also need to preserve food for export overseas make sure that it doesn't perish in transit. And lastly, we need to be able to preserve food for when there are food shortages. There are a number of methods of preserving food which involve both high and low temperatures, chemicals, irradiation and drying. Let's have a look at these in turn. In the 1870s, the French scientist Louis Pasteur showed that microorganisms in food could be destroyed by raising the temperature of the food, a process now known as pasteurization. This involves heating milk to just 65 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. A new method, the ultra-high temperature, or UHT process, involves heating milk to 150 degrees Celsius for 3 seconds. The advantage of treating milk in this way is that it lasts much longer, though I tend to feel, and I'm sure many of you would agree, that taste is somewhat sacrificed in the UHT process. <laughs> <laughs> Tin cans were first used in the early 1800s to store and preserve food. Just as they are now, the cans were tin-plated steel containers, and the process had the advantage of being cost-effective. Unfortunately, however, there were many early cases of food poisoning because the canning process was not fully understood at that stage. We now know the exact temperature and length of time each food needs for proper preservation, which has greatly reduced the risk of food poisoning. People living in cold climates often preserve food by burying it in the snow, and the Romans knew all about the advantages of packing food in ice. But for most people, this was not an option until the invention of the refrigerator in 1834. Today, however, refrigeration is the most important means of preserving food because the food stays fresh without needing to be treated. However, refrigeration requires an electricity supply and unfortunately, if the power goes off, so does the food. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. A variety of chemicals can be added to food and you'll find their names listed on the labels of cans and bottles. Salt is probably the oldest of all the chemical preservatives and was used by many ancient civilizations for many years. Sugar also acts as a preservative and is used to preserve jams in much the same way that Vinegar is used to pickle foods. Chemical preservatives are effective, but they do not suit all foods, and the processes involved are time-consuming. Another method of preserving food is by drying it. Most foods are 75% to 90% water, so if you remove the water, the microorganisms simply can't survive. 
When food is dried, it not only lasts a long time, but it also becomes much lighter, which is a big advantage, as this makes it cheap to store. Though some people argue that valuable nutrients are lost in the process. Early methods for drying food involved cutting it into strips and hanging it in the sun or over fires. But there are now a number of more modern methods which involve the use of recent technology. One of these is known as roller drying, and it's a highly effective way of making dried foods from liquids, such as soup. Have a look at this diagram to see how it works. Well, first of all, the hot soup is poured in at one end here. The liquid spreads to form a thin layer on a heated belt. The liquid dries as it moves along. By the time it reaches the end of the belt, all the water has evaporated, leaving only dry powder. A blade then scrapes the dried material off the roller and captures it in powder form. All you have to do is add boiling water and you have your hot soup back again, ready to drink. Another method is called freeze drying. And for those of you who still remain... That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You'll hear a tutor and three students discussing their work. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning everyone. Well, in today's tutorial we're going to discuss the essays that you have to submit by the end of next week. Some of you will have already started them, which is good. And if you haven't, well that's okay, but you'll have to get a move on. So, let's begin with you, Simon. Uh, what's happening with you? Well, I've made a start on it. I researched the background quite extensively last weekend. And I should get to the writing stage tomorrow with a bit of luck, and I'll get finished at the weekend. Uh, what are you writing about? I decided to look at the car manufacturing company Jaguar, examine the problems they had with reliability in the 1970s and 80s, how they dealt with it, and how it affected their marketing and sales strategy. That sounds pretty interesting. Any problems with that? At the start, I had problems getting information from that far back, but after rooting around in the library, I found some magazines which gave me information and also gave me references to find other stuff. It seems now the only problem is keeping to the 4,000 word limit. It just seems I have so much to write about. It seems I'll need 5,000 or even 6,000 words to be able to cope. Yes, your essay title seems to me to be very wide-ranging. Would you think about cutting out part of it? How about looking at their sales and marketing strategy, but only mentioning the problems in the 70s and 80s and not going too far into it? That's a good idea. That will make it much easier to handle. By the way, how do you want us to hand in our work? Do you want us to drop in a hard copy to your office? You could do that, but I'd prefer it if you just emailed it to me as an attachment. You've all got my address. If not, give it to the secretary clearly marked that it's for me. Right, Jennifer, how about you? Uh, I've not really got going on it yet, but I have decided on a subject. I'll try and do some research during the rest of this week, and I should get writing this weekend. OK, uh, what are you writing about then? 
I want to look into how supermarkets use market surveys to develop their products. Uh, will you have enough time to find out what sort of things that the supermarkets do? You won't have much time for that. I should be OK. I've had a look in the stack system in the library and I've found a magazine that surveyed all the UK major supermarkets and a trade publication that analysed the same things in Canadian supermarkets. Mm, be careful about using their conclusions too much. The university takes a tough stance on plagiarism. Make sure you properly list where you get your information from in a bibliography and try and do your own analysis. Get going too, as that analysis will take a bit of time. OK, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. And Melanie, how is your work going? I'm a bit behind, I'm afraid. I was sick all last week and the weekend with flu. I've got a subject to think, but I've not done any work on it yet. Is there any chance I can get an extension to the submittal date? The policy of the department is not to give any extensions unless there are extenuating circumstances. Do you have a doctor's certificate or anything? I went to the doctor's, but I didn't get a note, as I didn't realise I would need it. The doctor will have a record of me, though, as I got a prescription. I'll go back and get one. Yes, do. If you get one, then there shouldn't be a problem getting an extension. Without it, though, you'll be in trouble. What subject are you considering, anyway? I thought I'd do an overview of the UK mortgage interest rates and their effect on housing sales trends over the last ten years. I thought it might be of interest because of the huge increases of house prices over the last decade. Certainly an interesting subject, and it should be no great problem getting information, as this has been fairly well documented. It's a lot of work again, though, and you'll really need to get cracking on it, even with the extension, if you get one. Well, I've not got much on for the rest of the week, and I've set aside the weekend to really get to grips with it. Good. Now, is there anything else? That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 You will hear a conversation between two students, Peter and Susan. They will talk about their activities at the weekend. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Susan. Hi, Peter. It's Friday again. Anything particular you want to do at the weekend? No, nothing particular in mind. Maybe tonight I'll go to a pub with some friends for the happy hour. You know, drinks are half price at weekends, and I don't have to get up very early tomorrow. Saturday morning, that's the time for washing my car, doing the laundry, and then go out for brunch. That's breakfast and lunch combined, right? Yes, that's it. You can spend two hours or more over brunch. It's a huge meal. You can have all the breakfast things as well as all sorts of lunch things, such as salads, chicken, pies and fruit. It's not expensive. You just pay £7 per person. For that, you can eat as much as you like. It's a good time for all the family. Oh, that sounds good. What do you usually do at weekends? On Sundays, I have a lot of newspapers to read. So do I. I sit in the garden over a cup of coffee with a continental breakfast and read that it's Sunday newspapers. Relax. How about Saturdays? Oh, I usually go to a club to play chess with some friends. I love the game very much. It's great fun, isn't it? Yes, lots of fun. I enjoy playing chess on Saturdays. I've never played chess, but I'd like to learn it someday. Is it difficult to learn? No, not at all. I can teach you if you like. 
A week later. Now Susan is teaching Peter how to play chess. Listen to their conversation. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Could you teach me how to play chess now? Yes, it's a board game played by two persons. How many pieces does each person have? Sixteen pieces. Each player has two rooks, two bishops, two knights, one king, one queen, and eight pawns. One person uses the light-coloured pieces, and the other plays with the dark-coloured pieces. The colours are always called white and black, even if they are cream and red. At the beginning of the game, the pieces are set up on the chessboard, as shown in the picture. Oh, I see. There are sixty-four squares on the board. The rows of squares across the board are called ranks. You mean the horizontal rows? Yes, the rows of squares up and down. I mean the vertical rows are called files. Lines of squares running diagonally are called diagonals. How to move the pieces? There are some rules. Each of the pieces has to move in a certain way. The players take it in turns to move their pieces and can move only one piece in each turn. Once you have touched a piece, you must move it. After you have moved it and taken your hand away, you must leave the piece where it is. So, you are not allowed to change your mind. No. Each player has two knights: a king's knight and a queen's knight. They are shaped like a horse's head. The knight is the only piece which can jump over pieces. It can jump over pieces of its own colour, or over enemies' pieces. The knight can move in any direction, forwards, backwards, or to either side, but it always has to move three squares at a time. When the knight moves, it must go two squares in one direction and then one square to the side. I have to remember this. What is the aim of the game? Well, it's to trap your opponent's king, so it can't escape being captured. That is, there are no squares for it to escape to, no pieces to protect it, and no pieces to capture the checking piece. When this happens, it is called checkmate, and the player with the checking piece or pieces wins. I'm afraid I need a lot of practice. Thank you very much. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. In this section, you'll hear a message left to John on how to look after the house. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, John. Welcome to the house. I'm really pleased that you can be here to look after my house while I'm away. Here are some things you need to know about the house. Important stuff like when the garbage is collected. In fact, let's start with the garbage, which is collected on Friday. Just write garbage on the calendar on the days they take it away. Put it out on Friday every week. That'll be Friday the twenty-second, 
Friday the 29th and Friday the 5th. It's a really good service. The trucks are quiet and the service is efficient. The bin would be put outside of the house empty. It's a good idea to put it away quickly. This street can be quite windy. I once watched my next door neighbor chase her bin the whole length of the street. Every time she nearly caught up with it, it got away again. The waste paper will be collected this Tuesday. That's Tuesday the 19th. There's a plastic box full of paper in the front room. Please put it out on Tuesday. The truck will come during the day. If you don't mind collecting old newspapers and other paper and putting them in the box, I'll put it out when I come home. The paper people only come monthly. I have some things to give to charity in a box in the front room. Would you put it out on Monday the 25th, please? It's a box of old clothes and some bed linen which I've collected, plus a few other bits and pieces. The charity truck will come by during the day on the last Monday of the month. Like the paper people, it comes monthly. If you want to use the library, you'll find it on Darling Street. I've left my borrower's card near the telephone. It has a very good local reference section if you want to find out more about this city. The library is open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday to Saturday. I'm sorry to say that we don't have a cleaner. Oh, yes, filters. Would you please change the filters on the washing machine on the last week of the month, no matter which day? We find that the machine works much better if we change the filters regularly. The gas company reads the meter on the 30th, the last Saturday. I think that's all the information about our calendar of events. Well, John, I'm trying to think what else I should be telling you. As you know, I'm going to a conference in London. I hope to have a little time to look around. It's a great city. I do hope I manage to get at least some of the theatres and museums. I'm looking forward to all the things I have to do at the conference, too. I'm giving a paper on Tuesday the 26th, and there are a couple of exciting events planned later in the conference programme. I hope to meet up with an old teacher of mine at the conference. She taught English literature at my high school, and we've kept in touch through letters over the years. She now teaches at the University of Durham, and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. By the way, I expect you're hungry after your trip. I've left a meal in the refrigerator for you. I hope you like cheese and onion pie. Would you do me a favor, please? I haven't had time to cancel an appointment. It was made a long time ago, and I forgot about it until this morning. It's with my dentist for a checkup on Thursday the 28th. Could you please call the dentist on 8162525 and cancel the appointment for me? Thanks a lot, John. One last thing. When you leave the house, make sure the windows and doors are shut and set the burglar alarm. The alarm code number is 9120. Have fun. I'll see you when I get back. This is your friend Martha saying goodbye. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.